Hello, and welcome to Stars, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. My name is Hugh Ross. I'm the founder of Reasons to Believe, and today we explore uh, the topic of digital health and of viruses. But before we get into the discussion, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, our Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, so that you can be notified of our new weekly videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at rtb underscore official. Well, I'm joined today uh, by uh, James Peterson, Jim Peterson, uh, pardon me, James Patterson. Sorry about that, uh, uh, Jim. And I'm going to read right. you uh, a bio. And, uh, you know, you go back a long ways with reasons to believe. So uh, uh, it's great to have you with us here. James C. Patterson II. Uh, he's a double doctorate. He's got an MD and a PhD. And he's the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at uh, LSU Health in Shreveport, Louisiana State University. He's also a joint faculty member in the Department of Pharmacology, Toxicology, and Neuroscience. Dr. Patterson has been in Shreveport since 2000, has risen to the position of professor and chair, and also serves in the role as the Christus Schrumpert Chair of Neurobiology. He's also the clinical director of the Louisiana Addiction Research Center, as well as the chief medical officer of Louisiana Behavioral Health. Dr. Patterson received his undergraduate degree in biology from Lamar University, followed by his combined doctorate of medicine and PhD in neuroscience from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, where he, all, he has also completed his internship and residency in psychiatry. He completed a psychiatry and functional neuroimaging fellowship at the National Institutes of Mental Health's Laboratory of Brain and Cognition in Bethesda, Maryland. He is a board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Dr. Patterson lives in Shreveport, Louisiana with his wife of 30 years, uh, Lois. He has two grown children, two grandchildren, 1.5 dogs. I got to ask you a question about the 0.5 dogs and a cat. His hobbies include woodworking with a sawmill, cutting trees down, cutting trees up, and working with raw wood products to build things from scratch. Boy, it sounds like a lot of what my, my father did because I was raised in coastal British Columbia mm -hmm. where there was raw wood uh, everywhere. But please explain the 1.5 dogs. Sure, happy to. Um, we have two dogs, a, a Welsh Corgi, which is my wife's dog, and a Australian Shepherd, which is my daughter's dog. And the Welsh Corgi loves my son and will hop in the car and leave at a moment's notice with almost anybody. But if my son comes over, he picks up our dog and takes him and they basically kidnap him for about half the time. So we only have him about half the time and other than that, he's at my son's house. So I tell people we have one and a half dogs and uh, our dog is very happy with this arrangement. My other dog, the, Wells, the, the Australian Shepherd does not like my son at all and won't go anywhere with him. So he stays with us. Well, good. Well, Jim, one reason why I volunteered to uh, you know host this with you is that my younger son is now doing a postdoctoral fellowship in clin clinical neuropsychology. He's very interested in your subject. And he said, Dad, please report to me back uh, what you hear uh, uh, from Jim. So uh, yeah. yeah, so we... I wind up talking on uh, neuropsychology with my son all the time. I keep feeding him research papers. He feeds me papers. And mm -hmm. uh, he's very much interested in how, uh, you know, the, your physical health can influence your mental health. So uh, uh, I'm going to be reporting to him uh, what you got to share with us today. But uh, your theme is digital health. And sure. it takes me back to a movie I saw, G about 40 years ago, where you saw an individual saying, I am not a number, I'm a human being. So with that, take it away. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I just do want to, to start out by saying that um, there's, there's two things that I recommend to everybody as far as treatment or cure for 
the, the ailment of society, and that is diet and exercise. Uh, and I'm, I'm not necessarily very good on the diet part right now. I need to work better on that. And I remember from my cruise at RTB about you talking about your very healthy diet and I hope you're still doing that. You look like you're still fit and I, I need to get Yeah, back. I do maintain a healthy diet and uh, I've been to Louisiana and that's a real challenge to stay it's on a healthy diet challenge. in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> and, but, but we are going to work out. My wife and I are definitely going to the gym and working out. Um, and we do love going hiking and going camping and getting out in the outdoors. Are good for you. And I think that's really important. I saw a study, well, I saw a research article, some, some, something like the one in Psychology Today, that talked about the benefits of simply going outside for a walk. Not yes. just going for a walk, but going outside into what I consider to be God's creation. And, you know, looking at the stars, looking at the sky, looking at creation. And I, I really think that's, that's very important. Um, so that, that's get, that gets me kind of a segue into what we want to talk about. Um, and I want, to, I want to begin with an anecdote from Walt Disney World. Um, I went to Walt Disney with my family twice. Once in 2003 and again in 2009. In the interim, in between there, uh, the smartphone basically revolutionized the way we communicate. And in 2003, my kids were younger, obviously, and uh, we had a great time. Um, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, the whole shebang had a, had a wonderful, wonderful time at Walt Disney. And we had a good time in 2009 as well. But I immediately, upon walking in to Walt Disney World, noticed something very different. And I actually commented it on to, it, my, to my wife, Lois, and I said, everybody's looking at their phones. Everybody was doing this. And I, of course, have mine laying right here. They were looking down at their phone. They were looking at the schedule to get into the rides. They were looking at the map. They were looking at, you know, various attractions. They were, they were looking at their phone. They were not looking up. And, and, and that is 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago. In the preceding 13 years, I, I think that right? 13 years? Am I getting the math right? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that it's gotten worse. It's gotten more. Um, as, the, as the chair here, we have a grand rounds session that happens every week on Friday at noon. And one of my residents recently gave a grand rounds on obesity in our society. And the obesity is just skyrocketing. And when you look and see what it correlates with, and correlation does not mean causality, of course, but it correlates very closely with the onset of digital media and the onset of smartphones and using, you know, uh, what, what's called uh, social media. Um, this is concerning, not just because of the health benefits, but what the way I characterize it is that the more we are connected through these, the less we are connected through human interpersonal relationships in person. Now, I, I want to point out here the irony of this statement and that we are connected interpersonally face-to-face -face across three time zones between Louisiana and California through Zoom. And that's a very useful tool, but it does not and cannot replace what I would say is uh, in-person communication. I think that that's definitely something that we're, we're losing. And losing. The more we're connected this way with these guys, the less we're connected in person. Well, Jim, on a recent trip to Hong Kong, I saw four young women in their early 30s walking down a street all of them were on their cell phones. They were side by side walking down the street and they were talking to one another. But instead of putting their phones down and actually engaging one another face to face, they were engaging one another through their phones. So right. it's not the same world that it was 30 years ago. Right. And this is uh, the article that I wanted to, to discuss a little bit was from Psychology Today. And 
this is by a gentleman by the name of Glenn Geeger. And Glenn has written a book on the, on the, the topic of, of positive evolutionary psychology, which we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but he does have some really good points in his article about the fact that as a society, whether we are evolved or whether we are designed by God, and of course, I believe in the latter, today, we are doing things in a different way than we were 20 years ago, or certainly 50 years ago, and even really certainly 100 years ago. Um, I have a favorite graph that I like to show in one of my Grand Rounds presentations um, about uh, the onset of television. And so television came about in the 40s, and by the 50s, the average human family was spending four hours in front of a, in front of a TV screen. Now that's per family, not per individual. And now per individual, it's over 11 hours a day. Now, when you think about that, you, you, you think that your day is kind of broken up into threes. You should sleep for eight hours, you should work for eight hours, and you should relax for eight hours. And here we are spending 11 hours in front of the screen. Well, I, I can attest to the fact that I'm at work right now and I have more than one computer screen in front of me open right now. And so, I, I believe that statistic that it's 11 hours, but when you're at home, it's not just, you know, I, I watched my daughter, uh, and if, I'm gonna show this to my daughter, Ellen. Uh, I watched my daughter, Ellen, watching Netflix, trying to do her homework on her laptop and on social media on her smartphone, all at the same time. Wow. <laughs> okay, and that's that's our society today. That's, that's our 20 somethings today. And you know, I, I think it has a lot to do with where we are in terms of mental health and mental wellness, and that we're having more problems with mental health and mental wellness because of that. In other words, uh, trying to manage three uh, screen devices simultaneously uh, leads to stress. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that that is definitely part of it. Um, I, I don't. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's worth mentioning there's a very good documentary out there about the impact of social media on mental health. Um, I didn't produce it and I don't have anything to do with it. So I don't have any conflict of interest, but it's called The Social Dilemma. And of yes, course- I've seen it. I've seen an excellent documentary. Yeah, it's on Netflix, I believe. And of course, so you have to use digital media to watch it, but that's, that's where our society is today. We, we make use of these tools, but they can be, they can be overdone. And so I have, uh, as a psychiatrist, I do inpatient psychiatry and emergency psychiatry. And, you know, I can't tell you the number of patients that I have admitted to the hospital in the past six months to nine months to a year who, I'll give you an example, a young lady who was 18 years old, still in high school, could not and did not transition back from the social isolation post COVID. And when I asked her how much time she was spending on social media, she pretty much said, yeah, she was, she was there all day. If she wasn't asleep, she was on social media. She wasn't doing her homework. She wasn't going to class virtually. And uh, she was very, very depressed, very sick young lady. So we are, um, and I, I do want to mention that we just here at Oshner LSU or LSU Health published a news article or, or a scholarly article about uh, body in high school students, that the, high, the more you spend time on social media, the more problems you have with body image, which of course makes perfect sense to us, but it's uh, it's borne out in our students here in Shreveport and Caddo Parish. Now you began the conversation by saying that there is this strong link correlation uh, between uh, what's happening today in digital media and obesity. Yes. Uh, can you get a little more specific about what psychologists have discovered is, uh, is going on with that correlation? Well, that's not in this topic, but the, the, it's pretty straightforward. The thing about it is if you're sitting and staring at a screen, it's hard to do exercise. It's not impossible. I, I want you to understand that one of the most popular Christmas gifts last Christmas or the Christmas before was this exercise bike that had this virtual reality type interface with it so you could bicycle down the road while you're in your living room so again it's pretty cool and you're exercising 
but it's not the same as riding your bike through the neighborhood or through, through, through nature. Um, so the more we're spending time in front of a computer screen, the less time we are spending active. And so the sedentary lifestyle is causing some definite problems that increased in obesity and problems with body image. And that is mentioned in this, in this little article. He talks about um, that uh, <clears throat> the life with social media and the internet is not all peaches and cream and rates of mental health problems increase with markers of population density. And this is something that, you know, I think it has more to do with, uh, I, I guess, so I see it from the other side. I think that those who live closer to nature would have less depression. Now, I, I don't have any research to back that up. I'd have to do some research on that research topic to back that up. But I suspect it's not necessarily being around a lot of people that makes you depressed. I think it might be away from nature that makes you depressed. I, that's a yeah. that's a hypothesis. Well, I've read several research papers that make that very point that uh, you know, with young children, uh, giving them an hour of unsupervised playtime in a natural forest as opposed to a city park their yeah. scores go up. So their scholastic capability goes up, their mental health improves. So there's a difference between being outside in a human environment uh, where you've got concrete and steel and glass all around you, as opposed to being in a place where there's natural grass, trees, wildlife, uh, that that makes a difference. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and again, the fact that if you get outside, it actually improves the health of your eyes there's research that shows that spending time outside, especially in the morning uh, as the sun is rising, uh, that this significantly improves the health of your eyes. And that in nations where that doesn't happen, uh, you got myopia that's just gone out of sight. Like South Korea, 95% of the population suffers from myopia. Well, most South Koreans live in huge cities and they don't get outside in the early morning and therefore they suffer to a greater degree than people who say who live in rural Louisiana. That makes really a whole lot of sense. Um, now, that being said, my wife grew up in the country and has horrible vision, but she got glasses and surgery to, to fix that. But one of the points made in this article is that the nomads had ample physical activity and only natural diets. And, you know, obviously that it's hard to say whether their lifestyle was better than ours, but certainly it had a lot going for it in terms of healthiness, in terms of physical activity and uh, super processed foods are definitely something that we suffer from that is hard to get past, it really is. So, you know, the bottom line is we are living in a society that is very different than 20 years ago. Um, and wow. our, whether you wanna look at it from design or evolution, what are we going to do about that? How do we move forward to, to improve our own health and digital and wellness? And, and I have a friend of mine and, and a member of the department who's a gratis faculty member who is very invested in digital wellness. And it's, it's, a, it's something that we look at now as sort of an addiction that, you know, in fact, the next grand rounds I'm going to do is the world's most popular addiction. It's right here. So... We have to be we have to be aware of it and think about that and and get away from it. Well, Jim, you've given us a lot of bad news, and you hinted that there is good news. I mean, how should we respond to this challenge of this overwhelming digital environment that we're experiencing? What's the way forward? Obviously, we don't want to throw away all of our computers, all of our smartphones. I mean, there's some great benefits there, but what is the positive way forward? Well, I think it's education and awareness is very important. N knowing that there is a problem is halfway to overcoming the problem. And just being aware, you know what? My screen time is really up today. I need to turn this off and go outside. I need to look at the stars. I need to go for a walk in the country. I need to go for a hike and, and do that. Don't just think about it while you're surfing on the internet looking for places to go hike, but <laughs> actually go. You know, my wife and I love to go camping and, and going to go and hiking. So um, it's something that you really should take into account in your in your walk. Um, 
it helps you get closer to God. It really does when you go outside and look at the stars. I mean, the the Bible is very clear about that. The the the, the and I love your background um, behind you. It's because that is uh, it. It certainly is. It connects you to to God when you get out into nature. And well, get away the Bible from tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. Absolutely. The vast majority of human beings, the heavens aren't declaring much at all because of our light pollution, because of we living in these huge cities. I know. Where I live, I look up at the night sky on a really clear night. Maybe I can see 30 stars. Abraham could see 15,000 stars. And for the first time in the history of humanity, in the 21st century, the majority of human beings have never seen the Milky Way. And now we got the problem that the majority of human beings haven't had contact with wild mammals and wild birds. They've yeah. been around dogs and cats that are domesticated in their homes. Uh, they see the sparrows flying around and the pigeons, but they're really not out where you got the wild nature. And it tells us in the book of Job, look to these wild birds, look to these wild mammals. They will teach you lessons and immense spiritual lessons. And something I've observed as I traveled around the world, when I'm speaking in rural parts of the world, very high percentage of people believe in God and the God of the Bible, especially, but it's in the big metropolitan cities where I meet all the atheists. I think of all the atheist scientists that I've debated over the years, every one of them lives in a big metropolitan city. So I think you're making a good point. Our isolation from nature, our lack of outdoor activity, not only has physical consequences impacting our physical health, it has mental consequences that affects our spiritual health as well. It absolutely does. And I have to agree that, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God is, is really one of my, my favorite Bible verses. And uh, there's, there's much to be said about that. And I, uh, I, I can't, I can't say it any better than, than the Bible does. I, I can assure you of that. So I, I think that, Makes me want to go for a hike. It really does. Well, you're a man after my own heart. I make it a point to go for a morning run, get out in nature. And I can tell you this. I remember uh, years ago where my wife and I were living in a small townhouse. And, you know, I would try to run every morning, but I was running on city streets. I had to stop at the stoplights uh, and everything was paved. Uh, where we live now, uh, within 150 yards, I can be in a national forest. I get to run on mountain trails. I get to see wildlife every day. I can tell you personally, it's made a big difference, not just in my physical health, but my mental health. There's something restorative about being exposed uh, to the world that God had created, as opposed to the world that we human beings have modified. So thank you for your message. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, we will include a link to the article that you uh, mentioned. And uh, also, uh, you know, we're going to make a link for people to get the resources that you've been producing uh, for us at Reasons to Believe. Well, let me segue to the discovery that I wanted to talk about. And it's somewhat related. I mean, I'm an astrophysicist, but I like reading outside of my discipline. And uh, you know, I've been fascinated by viruses and viruses get a bad rap. You know, we get the common cold, we got flu, we got COVID, all these viral diseases. And every time I run into people uh, who don't have a scientific background, they think all viruses are bad. And so I, oh, no, I don't think so. Not at all. Uh, in fact, when I, I read the article that uh, I, I tried to read the article that you, you were, you sent and I was like, wow, that's really deep. Uh, <laughs> But it did remind me of something that uh, um, from 2009 in the Annals of New York Academy of Sciences, uh, an old, a whole series about what's called the, let me see if I can find Revisiting the Central Dogma in the 21st Century by James Shapiro. And in this entire article, you know, the Annals of New York Academy of Sciences, they like to do volumes. And so it talked about natural genetic engineering and things of that nature. The bottom line is they talk about the importance of viruses in, from their perspective, evolution, from our perspective, creation. 
and they're very important. Like a huge component of us is bacteria and a huge component of us is also viruses. And the viruses keep the bacteria under control. And so we're now aware that viruses were here at the very first time that uh, microbes were on the face of the earth. They had to be, because otherwise those microbes would have multiplied, earth would have become a gigantic bacterial slime ball and would have consumed all the resources. And then they would have all died and our planet would have been permanently sterile. But the fact that there were viruses there at the same time as the first microbes that God created meant that the viruses could actually control the populations of the bacteria because viruses predominantly feed on bacteria. I mean, they do infect us, but their number one host is bacteria. And, uh, you know, they attack the bacteria. And so they keep the bacterial populations at an optimal level. And that's what amazes me is the diversity of viruses, the population of viruses is optimal. So that we have the optimal amount and diversity of bacteria, not too many bacteria, not too less bacteria. And then I think of uh, our, our water cycle. I mean, viruses play the predominant role in the precipitation we get because viruses are tiny particles. They make the seeds for raindrops. But as they attack bacteria, they break the bacteria up into small pieces, and those small pieces float up in the atmosphere. So that provides a second source of seeding uh, for rain and snow. And so we're here because the viruses uh, give us an adequate uh, precipitation level all over the planet. But this particular paper published in Science is uh, making the point uh, that these viruses uh, attack uh, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton that's in the oceans. And uh, they- I, I remember up. from from my studies early on as a RTV scholar back in the day, that, that plankton are really important, right? They are, they are, they're over half the productivity of planet Earth. And what I mean by productivity, photosynthesis that takes water and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and transforms that into sugars, starches, and fats and produces oxygen. Most of the oxygen we breathe comes from the phytoplankton. And so they play a crucial role in the oxygen cycle of the earth, but they're also the base of the food chain. And uh, so they're the base of the marine food chain, mm -hmm. as well as uh, the microbes on the face of the earth uh, on the continents or the base of the food chain on the continents. But what they discovered is that these viruses uh, that are on the surface of the world's oceans are making sure that the phytoplankton are at optimal levels. I mean, if those phytoplankton were to multiply out of control, uh, you would get these algae blooms that would yeah. be toxic. It would kill off all the fish. Uh, it would impact the oxygen levels in the atmosphere. And so we need the viruses to keep the phytoplankton at the optimal level. Uh, but as they uh, uh, fall prey on these phytoplankton, basically do the same thing they do to the bacteria. They break them up and then you got these viral particles and the particles of the phytoplankton that they attack begin to sink into the ocean. And eventually they make it to the bottom of the ocean. But while they're sinking into the ocean, they provide a food supply uh, for the animals, the micro animals and the major animals that are in the sea. So uh, all the fish that we see there, all the marine life we see there, uh, a lot of their survival is based on the food that they get uh, from these virus, viruses feeding on the phytoplankton and breaking them up. And not all of that stuff gets eaten. A lot of it winds up falling on the bottom of the seafloor. And so uh, this, and that's where you got the plate tectonics that will drive all that stuff into the mantle of the earth. And so what this paper, and I got another paper with me too, published a couple of years earlier, that makes the point <clears throat> that viruses play a crucial role in regulating the carbon cycle of the earth. And I think that's fairly obvious because these oh, yeah. 
if they if they play a crucial role in regulating phytoplankton and phytoplankton are 50 percent of that carbon cycle that that seems there's a lot of carbon important. in uh, the phytoplankton yeah. and so uh they're taking the carbon that's in the phytoplankton pulling it down to the bottom of the ocean where the plate tectonics drives it into uh, the mantle and then there's mantle recycling that brings some of that carbon back up into the atmosphere we call that the carbon cycle, but the point is that carbon cycle must run at exactly a precise rate in order to maintain the diversity and the abundance of Earth's surface life. So you don't want too much of that carbon being dragged into the mantle or too little being dragged into the mantle, and the viruses make sure that it's at that just right level. Uh, but this previous paper is making the point uh, that the viruses also play a crucial role in the sulfur cycle, in the nitrogen cycle. And it's crucial that you know sulfur, nitrogen, and carbon, these are yeah. nutrients for life. And yeah. if those nutrients aren't recycled at the just right level, life dies off. I mean, of all the sulfur and the carbon, the nitrogen gets driven into uh, the crust of the earth and in the mantle of the earth, or it gets pumped into the atmosphere, it's not available for surface life. You have to keep it cycling at just the right level, and you want the cycling to be global so that you can have the diversity of life globally. And these two papers are basically pointing out for the first time, we've been able to actually do uh, observations that tell us how many different species and genera of viruses do we have? And they're using they the words. Some, haven't they discovered some new, uh, new types of viruses or new generic? That's uh, what these two papers are all about. Yeah. They said we haven't really fully appreciated the contribution that viruses make to the carbon, sulfur, and nitrogen cycles because we don't have a good inventory of all the different kinds of viruses. Now, they are careful in their language because there's a huge debate going on in the biological community. Are viruses really alive? Uh, should we really be counting them as life forms? Because after I, all... I was in school. I mean, what is life? I don't think we've ever decided on a, follow, a right. consensus on, on what life is. That's, that's Yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely yeah. controversy. <clears throat> Yeah, because viruses are basically pieces of DNA or RNA, and they can only do their thing if there's, uh, you know, living organisms that they can parasite upon. So it's a major debate. And I do appreciate that the authors of these papers saying we don't mean species and genera like we do with the rest of, you know, with bacteria and more complex life. But we do see that there's different categories of viruses. So they say species-like, genera-like, but they've now identified uh, a minimum of about 20,000 different kinds of viruses that exist on the surface of the world's oceans and are basically making the point we need at least that level of diversity in order for these viruses uh, to play the crucial role that they do in ensuring that the carbon, the sulfur, and the nitrogen cycles operate at just right level. And as I read these papers, I said, it's not just that cycle. They play a role in the oxygen cycle as well, the deep oxygen cycle. And so we need to really be giving credit to these viruses. They've gotten a bad rap, uh, but we owe our very existence to viruses and we owe our very existence to our creator ensuring that a planet has the just right diversity and abundance levels of these viruses. And yes, we human beings mess things up with the way we try to live with these viruses. I mean, we think about uh, what happened with COVID. Uh, a lot of that's our fault. We shouldn't be blaming the creator. We mismanage the planet. And hence, these viruses do more damage than God intends. And he's given us a technology to deal with these in a good way. So, I don't blame the creator for the current upper respiratory tract infection I have right now. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is. It could be a coronavirus. It could be a flu virus, but possibly the respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you get and you deal with through 
cold medication, but I, you know, I, I think the number that I recall is that possibly 17% of our DNA is evolved or pardon me, comes from viral particles. I don't know. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. Fuzz speaks about that a lot. How with, if you look at the human genome, we see pieces of the genome that look a lot like viruses. Yeah. And speculation amongst uh, geneticists that we, these viruses got incorporated into our genome through evolution. And Fuzz has written articles making the point that's not what's really going on. The creator knew that we'd be under constant viral attack. And so he built within our genome viral defense mechanisms. And uh, they're not exactly Ooh. like viruses, they're viral like. So when they talk about these genetic uh, components, uh, they do make the careful point, they're viral like they resemble viruses. And Fuzz's point is, they're not viral components. They're explicitly designed to give our bodies a defense mechanism against the inevitable viral attacks. And it's one reason why our genome is as large as it is. I mean, God wanted us to live 80 or 90 years, which meant we had to have a genome that would protect us against a variety of viral attacks over a period of 80 or 90 years. Mine's been, been doing a pretty good job fighting viruses. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's clearing up nicely. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It, and it, I remember my doctor years ago saying, hey, when we say it's a virus, we're basically saying your guess is as good as mine. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's yeah. something scientific about that. Viruses are incredibly complicated. And yeah. uh, we're, we're still learning a lot. And it's going to be a while before we really understand viruses at a level. I mean, I like what Genesis 1 says, how God put us in charge of the planet to manage it for our benefit and the benefit of all life. And that means we need to learn a lot more about viruses so we can do a better us, job of managing things. He put in us a deep desire to, to seek him out and find him and learn about the universe and creation. And, you know, I think that scientists do that every day. And so this article where we're finding all these new types of viruses, whether they're actual species or not, or alive or not, is beside the point that there's all these really, we're, we're finding new forms of life or new forms of new things that God has created all around us in the oceans. And they're important to our existence. Well, I remember discussing this with Buzz and his point is, you know, we can actually get a really good inventory of all these different viruses that exist. We might be able to find some that we can use and maybe engineer to a small degree and use them as a way uh, to heal genetic diseases in the human species. And so, because viruses are a great way of introducing oh, yeah. corrections. So yeah. they're getting close to that now with the, uh... You know, some of the folks in the in the, the research labs down the hall from me are using these new technologies, and I don't. It's called CRISPR, I believe. Yes, yes. And there are some amazing things they can do with CRISPR. Um, that's it's not something that I use in the emergency room very much with my patients, but uh, maybe one day. Maybe one day, yeah. And that day may not be too far off into the future. So. Absolutely. Viruses are important because of that, because the, the ability to do that relates to bacteria and viral DNA and the ability to insert and remove components of, of genetic material from cells. So that technology is, is there and it's, it's at our fingertips. Well, I'm also wanting to give you the last word here. Do you think there's any possibility uh, that our research into viruses uh, could actually have some applications in terms of mental health. You know, it's I don't want to rule it out or rule it in. It's certainly possible. The the most recent uh, advances in mental health have to do with uh, some things that, that I believe were discovered in, it was either Korea or China, where they dissociated nitric oxide synthase from serotonin transmission in came up with an acute remission in depression. So they've only seen it in mice so far, but uh, it's a new mechanism for the treatment of depression. Uh, I, I, I still want to 
push diet and exercise and eating healthy and going to walk in nature. But, you know, a lot of people who are trapped in the midst of cities don't have that. So it's possible if they can find a genetic mechanism somewhere where you can do some gene splicing, I don't want to rule it out. But right now, um, the, the, cure, the coolest thing we're looking at is psilocybin, believe it or not. Uh, it is a 5-HT2A receptor agonist and seems to have the ability to cause fairly acute remission symptoms of, of depression go away pretty quickly. Now, I'm not recommending that everybody go out and use mushrooms, which is where psilocybin comes from. There's a lot of research to be done, but you see it in the news a lot. And more importantly, we're trying, one of the biggest problems we have here and speaking with my LARCAT on the Louisiana Addiction Research Center, um, one of the biggest problems we have here has to do with amphetamine addiction, methamphetamine addiction. And every day the patients that come into the ER from, from using meth, it's getting worse and worse. Um, it's, there's, no, there's no tools to treat addiction. Um, oh, there isn't. And I saw that paper on serotonin and the experiments they did with mice. It seemed really fascinating okay. for the application. But there's other ways to uh, get your hormone imbalances where they're supposed to be uh, that yeah. don't require such drastic intervention. So I like your idea. Better uh, diet, uh, get outside, exercise. And hey, it's well known that if you have good diet and consistent mental and physical exercise, it's a great preventive against dementia. So uh, that's, and, that's one of the things that I tell my patients is that you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway. These two words are worse than anything else you want to hear. Diet, exercise. Because by the time they get to me, it's, you know, they, they've got to come up a long way. Going for a walk around the block for some patients is hard. You know, they're in such bad shape. But we try. Uh, good for you. Well, this has been really good having you on our Star Cells and God. I want to thank all of you for joining us today in Star Cells and God. Join the discussion in the comments below. Remember to like this video and to subscribe for more content. New episodes of Star Cells and God release each Thursday and are available here on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this video with a friend. And remember, the more we know about science, the more reasons we have to believe in Jesus Christ as creator, Lord, and Savior. Thank you.